We're grateful for the Holy Spirit that reveals truth and gives us a, an image of truth in our soul that enables us to tell the truth and hear it and understand it and believe it and know that it's true. But our world is full of deception and our enemies primary focus is on deceiving us. And boy, he's done a good job, especially in our nation right now, Lord. And so personally, Father, I'm pushing back against that. And, and with my prayers, as I speak to you about it, as I share with other people, I'm pushing, I'm pushing back against the lies, the lies that have persuaded uh, the young people that they shouldn't have children, that, that marriage is not good, that so many lies, Father, just so many terrible lies that our people have believed and, and they live under the burden of. And I, I pray that we start, thank you for what we did the first half of Ron's lesson of, of talking about Christ confronting evil in its, as its captive. So let's confront it today, Father, in our own life. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, you have Bibles, please, if you have Bibles, to go to Genesis chapter 24 on my Sunday night study. I teach a Sunday night study at 5 o'clock online. Most of you should be getting an email. Uh, I'll be expecting to see you tonight on Zoom. Go ahead and laugh. Yeah, uh, we're in the study of Rebecca and her deceiving of Isaac and Esau, trying to figure out. So we're in Genesis chapter 24, and before we get into it, listen, as a counselor, I've learned over many years, I've learned a couple of things. One is that when people come to you, <clears throat> they have to tell their story. People come and they have a story to tell. They're, this is their life. This is their experience. This is what they're going through. This is what's challenging them. This is what's hurting them. And they have to be able to get that out of them and share it and see it for themselves. And until they do that, at least to some degree, they will not listen to words of wisdom. They can't do it yet. They've got to, it's about what's going on in their life. It's not about fixing it yet. But hopefully at some point, people will say, okay, here's, where to, here's what it is. What do I do? What is God's plan to deal with it? And I've learned that I don't really start talking anymore until people are ready to listen. Because it's pearls before swine, if you understand. Not calling you swine by any means, it's just you have to be ready. So the question I have for you this morning is, are you still so focused on your circumstances and, and, and fussing about them, complaining about them, or are you ready for some solutions? Is that fair? Amen. So, let's talk solutions. But first, we've got to talk problems. So, Genesis 24, we meet Rebecca. Abraham sends his servant, Rebecca, I mean, to find a wife for Isaac. Sarah has just died, and they're all sad and upset. And so he goes, and he, he goes to Abraham's uh, relatives, and he finds Rebecca. And if you're in Genesis 24, he prays, starting in verse 13, Behold, I'm standing, he's talking to the Lord, I'm standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city, they're coming out to draw water. Now it may be it that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also. May be she the one, may she be the one whom you have appointed for my servant Isaac, for your servant Isaac. He's praying that God will reveal to him 
the right woman for Isaac. Well, Rebecca comes out and boom, follows the formula. Go over to chapter, uh, verse 25, uh, go over to verse 67. All things are arranged. Isaac brought, in her, Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Does anyone here doubt that this was the woman for Isaac? Anybody? We're going to go over three chapters. And this woman is going to lie, scheme, deceive, trick him in every way possible. Right? Do you know this story? <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Just because you're having trouble, and just because your partner's not doing the way you want them to do, does not mean that you're in the wrong relationship. Okay? Now, I'm not going to say yes or no about that. Nine times out of ten, you're right where you need to be. You're just still complaining. You're, still, you're not ready to listen to wisdom yet. You're still complaining about your circumstances and you're still blaming the other person. Okay? If that's where you are, it's where you are. I can't bring you along. That's not my job. That's between you and the Lord. But this was the marriage that God arranged <clears throat> and this woman gave him all kind of fits. And he, her, listen, he wasn't going along with her plan either. So, hey, it's not going the way you want. Well, maybe you're not. Maybe you don't really understand God's purpose for your marriage. Maybe you think it's about you being happy and you getting what you want and you getting this other person to change and be the way you want them to be. And it's really about God getting you changed to change to be the way he wants you to be. Hello? Amen? Any amens? Married people? <laughs> okay. Listen. And my wife's not up here so I can talk. <laughs> there's, one, there's a main reason why I talk about this all the time. It's because it's life. It's real life. It's my life. It's your life. It's our life. So let's figure out what God's doing. Let's quit fussing and complaining about it, and let's do it and do it right and do it His way so that we can get on with it and accomplish the goal for it. The church of Jesus Christ has zero credibility in the world, in the United States. One of the reasons is because we don't live out all that we've learned. We don't live it out. I'm challenging myself and you. So let's go to chapter 25. Let me show you another problem that they had. Uh, look at verse, I'll go to 19. Oh, no, excuse me. Go, go, to, go to verse 20. And Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah. And he prayed to the Lord and she became pregnant because she was barren just like Sarah. See, God, God married Abraham and Isaac to these barren women because he wanted this baby to be, these babies to be miracle babies. Quote, virgin birth babies type thing. So anyway, so, but the, ch the children struggled within her and she said, what's going on here, Lord? And she, she asked him, and he said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you, here's a prophecy and a promise of God to Rebekah. This is so important. Rebekah took this promise, principle, prophecy, 
and turned this into an entitlement of interpretation. She took the truth from God and used it to justify herself and entitle herself to determine God's will for her whole family. When, a, when Isaac wasn't going along with this plan, and listen, Isaac knew that Jacob was supposed to be over Esau. I'll show you why in a minute. He wasn't going along with it. He wanted Esau to get the earthly blessing. Listen, they're all tangled up about the earthly blessing. You know, the birthright blessing, the double portion and all that. That wasn't even the important part of it. The real important part of it, of the inheritance of Abraham, was the spiritual inheritance. That was what was important. The rest of it, Rebecca was so determined that Jacob was going to get this double portion, birthright, blessing. She schemes and lies to get it. Jacob never even used it, that we can tell. He didn't need it. Esau didn't either. They both became wealthy in their own right. They were so focused on the earthly instead of the spiritual. Does that sound familiar? How about your life? Now, so the, here's this thing. And what's interesting is verse 28. See if this sounds familiar when you get up to Jacob and Joseph. And now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. I, he and Isaac were a lot alike. You know, Isaac loved to go out and hunt and cook up this food. And, but uh, Rebecca, she loved Jacob because Jacob hung around with the women and was duly a child. He loved to cook because the next thing you read, he's cooking up some stew. He liked to hang out. But anyway, what do you have here? You have favoritism. Do you have any idea what favoritism did to Jacob's family? Where do you think he learned this? Listen, folks, the deceptions, the deceptions that destroyed your parents' family are going to destroy your own. They're going to destroy your own. If you don't wake up and get real with God, get real. Not just another Bible study. I mean, get real with God. Some of you have already, are already there. That stuff rolls. You know, the plumber is not the only one that stuff rolls downhill. Does that make sense? This rolled right down to Jacob's life, this favoritism. And he practices, he practiced it with Rachel and Leah and, and, and her children and Leah's children. Divided the whole family. They wanted to kill Joseph. They hated him, hated their father. That's what favoritism did. So, deception. Now today, what I want to talk about, if I can get through here, uh, God tells Rebekah that, that Esau's going to serve Jacob, and that came true. What I want you to understand is this promise and prophecy that he gave to Rebekah did not entitle her to begin to interpret what that meant for everybody's life. What biblical principles are you using to apply to someone else's life and saying, you're not living up to the Lord? Who are you blaming? Do I, am I fussing? I am. Because we're struggling to have loving, non-judgmental relationships. You don't know it, but there's finger pointing. My life, your life, there's finger pointing. I'm pointing at the Democrats. Now, if you're a Democrat in here, I'm sorry. Oh, I better be quiet. I'm going to get myself in big trouble. <laughs> I'm not here to get into politics, and that's, that's part of the deception. 
We think the politics are about politics. They're not. They're about the church. They're about me. They're about you. They're about us living this real Christian life so that the politics pale in comparison to people living the real Christian life. Truth. So, now, how do we know that Rebecca had the right idea but was wrong in deceiving? Uh, and I'll get to that. Let, let's go to Jeb, Genesis 27 real quick. And it came about when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim, he called Esau and said, go get me some food and fix it up the way I want it. I'm going to give you the blessing of the firstborn. The firstborn blessing. The firstborn blessing, this person who got the blessing was now the head of the family. He was the family judge. He was the family priest. He got a double portion of the, of the finances. He was in charge. Everybody served him. Everybody worked for him. He was the boss, just like Isaac was the boss. So he want, Isaac wants Esau to get this blessing. Rebecca, look at verse 5, was listening and when Esau went to the field, she went and got Jacob. Behold, I heard your father tell Esau, bring some game, prepare a savory dish, and I may eat, and I'm going to bless you in the presence of the Lord. So she said, now you go and get us a goat, two choice kids, goats, from, that I may prepare them just the way Esau would prepare them, the way your father loves. Then you're going to bring it to your father and pretend to be Esau so that he may bless you with this firstborn blessing before he dies. Of course, listen, Jacob isn't even close. I mean, Isaac isn't even close to death yet. He's got many more years he's going to live. It's interesting. So Jacob, <laughs> listen to what Jacob says. Jacob doesn't say, Mother, you know, that's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> Jacob said, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and he shall realize that I'm a deceiver in his sight, and I shall bring a curse upon myself, not a blessing. So he wasn't concerned about what was right or wrong. He was just about getting in trouble. I think that I can relate to that. Uh, anyway, so they go through this scam. You know the story. He goes, they, they, they get this lamb's wool and glue it to his arms and he goes in and pretends to be Esau and Isaac blesses him and he gets the blessing uh, Isaac comes in later and is all upset and, and decides he's going to kill Jacob he's going to kill Jacob so in verse 41 if you go to verse 41 this is we're going to get to the end of the story Isaac has told Esau that he's sort of out of luck. And in verse 41, Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessings which, was his, which his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called Jacob and said, behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning killing you. That's an interesting way to say that, huh? This is called inner dialogue, by the way. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, rise and flee to Haran, and my brother Laban, who turned out to be such an honest fellow himself, right? Uh, if you know this story, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you, <laughs> listen to what she said, and forgets what you did to him. I love that. Then I shall sin and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of both of you in one day? In other words, if, Jacob, if Esau kills you, then somebody's going to have to kill him and then I'll lose you both. Of course, she's already lost Esau. You think he ever trusted her again? But here's what I'm after, verse 46. But Rebekah said to Isaac, of course, listen, a little bit of the story. Esau had married these Hittite women. Two Hittite women he married. And they, her and Isaac, hated that because they were pagan. 
And they, of course, they wanted Esau to be a believer and marry a believing woman and, and follow the Lord, but he married these Hittite women. And it really, really rubbed them the wrong way. <clears throat> so Re Rebecca, I'm tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. These are his wife, Esau's wives. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be? And in verse 28, chapter 28, so Isaac called Jacob, blessed him and said to him, son, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Rise and go now. She told Jacob, the reason that you need to go to Laban is because you're in danger. But why didn't she tell that to Isaac? Why did she tell Isaac another story? You see the deception? It's true. They didn't want Jacob to marry but it's truth used to lie. I believe she did that because she was, wanted to avoid being responsible for her part in all this. She didn't want to call attention to the fact that Isaac, I mean, Esau was furious because she had cooked up this scheme to trick him and, and drawn everybody into it. Deception. Deception. Today, I wanted to set that up, but, but I want to give us just a model, a real quick model of human motivation and the way things work. I don't know if I can get this to work again, but yep, there we go. So this is just a, a little diagram. I don't know if you can see it or not, but God designed our body, soul, and spirit with both human needs and desires and spiritual needs and desires. Of course, we understand the human needs, like it's not good for man to be alone. That's a need. Uh, and because of that, there's a desire. This need produces a desire in you. The Bible makes it clear is that desire is what moves us, what moves us and drives us to do what we do. In every, in every possible way. Uh, the spiritual would be like John 37, 39. Uh, the spiritual thirst, and I've got that here. I'll read it in a minute. But the other would be Galatians 5, 16, and 17. We know that passage so well. Walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Right? The next part, though, says because the flesh produces desire contrary to the spirit and the spirit desire contrary to the flesh, both systems using what as the motivator? Desire. Desire is what motivates you. Desire says, I have a need. I have a need of some kind. Okay? It's natural. God made us that way. He made us not to be alone. He made us to need love. He made us to need approval. He made us to be included in a group, to be part, to be accepted, to be valued. We all need that. We all want that. The reason you want that is because I believe, and this is my theory, I believe that's how God made us. I don't believe anybody is existing without these needs. I mean, little babies, they have to be touched loved, held, or they literally will die. You can feed them, but if you don't touch them, they learned this in Russia in the orphanages. They just have hundreds and hundreds of kids, warehouse, they had to warehouse them. Little babies that had been born with no one to care for them. And so they would touch all of them that they could, but the ones they didn't get to would literally just die within a year old. They would die. They had to have that touch. Well, listen, that's human beings. Human beings have this need, not only for each other, but for God. Primarily, we're designed to be filled by God, okay? Now, this John 7, Jesus said, On the last day of the great feast, he stood and cried and said, If any man is thirsty, and let him come to me and drink. Now, this is a spiritual thirst. Come to me and drink, which is faith. He says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. 
This innermost being is this word is a word for an empty place. He spoke of the Spirit, whom whom those who believed were about to receive. So if you look at this diagram, if we can see this, I've got this yet. I don't know if you can see it in the back. This is, I don't want that. I want, I'll do red. This is this place of need inside of you. And it drives you. It makes you desire to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted, to be approved. It's, it's what drives, it's what's driven you your whole life. And what we do is we develop in our life, we take our faith and we attach it to certain objects that we believe will fulfill that. The first objects we attach to are people. Now, I know I'm messing that up. Can y'all see that? People? Can y'all in the back read that? Is it too small? People. People are your first object of love. You don't have God, right? You're born separated from God so that you can only attach to people. And you build your whole way of thinking and living based on what other people think. You know why that's such a powerful force in your life? It's been, it's been the focus of your life your whole life. Now, okay, one day, one day you get saved and say, over here, what these boxes are, these are your beliefs. Here's your desires, your needs. You take your volition and your faith and you build a belief system out of the world. One day you get saved and now you can begin to build a belief system out of the Word of God. You got these both. Now you got both systems, right? You're tempted over here, but you're not tempted by the Spirit, are you? The Spirit produces a desire to do God's will. The flesh produces a desire, listen, to meet your needs, your desires, apart from God. Apart from God. Many things that we want are not wrong. Let's take, you know, there's a normal, for adults, there's a normal sexual desire that people have. And you can meet that sinfully, or you can, through, in marriage, you can meet it righteously. Agreed? So, two different systems by which we develop. And I'll come back to that another time. But, these desires drive us. Now, we're looking at Rebecca. What was the object of her faith, hope, and love? Or maybe, maybe I should say who? Was it the Lord? It was Jacob, wasn't it? You ever known a mama live through her children? You ever known a mama that make her children way more important than anyone else? Hello. Willing to do whatever it takes. Deceive her husband. Huh. Deceive anybody, her other children, to promote this one child. <clears throat> Look, maybe they were just compatible. Maybe she didn't know how to get along with Esau. That's a lot of times what you see in families. It's not that you favor one child over the other. It's just that you're more like one child than the other, and you know how to talk to one child more than the other, and you fit better with one child than the other. It's just normal that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But the favoritism, that's a whole different thing. So what I'm after here is this desire system that we start with is because we're born spiritually dead, the devil hijacks us. He hijacks your needs and desires, and he deceives you into believing that you can find fulfillment apart from God. That's the world system. The whole world system is designed to, for you to pursue happiness, listen, through legitimate means. Marriage, family, success, finances, possessions, health, all on your own, all apart from God, all, all in front of what other people think. 
So many people are terrified of letting down and not, bec- not living up to what other people expect of them or whatever other people think. I mean, who in this room acts the way you do here when you go home? What mask do you wear in this room that you don't wear at home? Is that a fair question? I mean, is this, everything's nice and you're spiritual and you're mature and boy, you're, when you go home? Now, we're not saying come here and, (laughs) you know, fuss and fight. That we don't want, but let's learn to be real. See, deception, the world has taught us to live a certain way in front of people. It's a mask that we wear. So, one day we'll develop all this, but right now, the setup for deception is our corrupted human nature and our human agenda caused by spiritual death. Adam's sin corrupted the mentality of man. Human nature was originally God-centered, humble, teachable, and God-serving. That's Jesus. But the corruption caused us to instinctively approach life as self-centered people. We instinctively put self first. That was not the design. God did not make us that way. Sin made us that way. And this system that we're watching play out on our television screens is this worldly system the devil has created to pull everybody into it and keep us focused on it. I mean, the propaganda systems that are going in America today are just amazing. Just amazing to keep everything stirred up and everything divided. Uh, The evil that's come in and taken over certain small sections, people say, well, America's divided 50-50. That's not true. That's just not even close to true. No, there's just the appearance of that. Listen, I've got neighbors that they're liberal and, you know, I get along with them, mostly by not talking to them, but... uh, (laughs) But listen, if they needed me, I'd be right there. If I could help them, I'd be right there. I don't, you know, I think they're deceived into believing that man can create man's utopia with man's power and ability. That's the whole liberal view. The conservative view is that God's going to do all this. God's in control. Let God be in control. Rebecca, bring it back down to our life, was not willing to let Isaac fail. Let me show you one other thing. Go back to Genesis 27. No, man, Genesis uh, 27. Look at, uh, oh, let's see. Sorry. Look at verse 14. When Esau heard the words of his father that Jacob had come and stolen the blessing. No, look at verse 33. I said what I'm after. It's 33. 27, 33. When Isaac, his father, realized that it was Esau and that Jacob had come and stolen the blessing, it said, Isaac trembled violently. When I first read that, I thought, man, he's mad. He's going to get, somebody's going to pay. No, that wasn't an anger trembling. It was fear trembling. It's fearful word. It's a word for fear. He was afraid because he began to, I think he realized I wasn't supposed to promote Esau. He was manipulating. Rebecca's manipulating. Everybody's manipulating, deceiving, trying to get what they want, what they believe, their image, the image in their head, trying to make that happen. This is, this is what we've been deceived to believe we're to do with each other. We've been deceived to believe that getting what we think we want or what we think is important, 
what we've made important, what we've been deceived into believing him is important. Rebecca believed that Jacob had to have this earthly blessing. What about, I, I've got kids. I've got kids that are doing well in the earthly blessing. I've got some I don't know that will ever have earthly blessings. They're still getting a lot of my earthly blessings. But what is do I say, how, how's your kids? Oh, they're doing great. You know, she, she's got this job and that, and he's got that job. They're making this money and they live in this house in this part of town. And <clears throat> some Rebecca, as long as they're making money and doing well and they're staying married and they're moral, they're not Democrats. Uh, then I think they're doing okay. Listen, I would rather them be poor as church mice, but be in love with the Lord. I would, I, if I was living their life, I would give that, I would be willing to give that up in a heartbeat to be in love with the Lord. So, what is it, and you can read the rest of this, you know, uh, the devil's system deceive Rebecca into believing that it's that that the temporal pleasures and treasures the earthly treasures were worth deceiving her husband and Esau she wants to live out her life through Jacob's success his earthly success you know I don't know that she ever got that let me share this with you and then we'll close I I encourage you to make a commitment from now on to total honesty with God. Total honesty. And you say, I, I'm honest with God. I, I believe that. How about with yourself? How about with your partner? How about with the people in your life? Are you, are you willing to see the truth about yourself if it's not very flattering? If what you see is that you're still very deceived by this old way that the devil programmed you with, you're still living out of that, even though you've got all the spiritual look. You got the knowledge, you got the doctrine, you got the look, you got the place, everything, but you're still living the old way, focused on the earthly. Are you willing to see that about yourself? Are you willing to tell yourself the truth about that? And even more so, are you willing to change if that is the truth? How about a commitment to be totally honest with God, with yourself, with others? To tell the truth or at least don't lie. Don't pretend or don't deceive. Finally, as we close, are you ready to stop pointing fingers at the Democrats or the Republicans or your partner, or the circumstances, or your health, see ultimately who you're pointing at, and all of those things is God. Because God's the one whose, whose divine decree in eternity past determined that this would be your life this day. This is who you would be with, this is who you'd be married to, this is the children that you would have, this would be your life. And listen, it's for good. It's all for good. But some of it is hard, and some of it is not pretty when we actually look at ourselves for real. If you want to make it into God's good, you're going to have to be real about yourself and about your part in all this so that you can be free of it and, and be filled with God's love. Father, we love you. We're so grateful to be able to hear these words, to not just hear them, but to be ready to listen and to be ready to believe and to be ready to change, to actually change, real change. Not just hear it again, but be willing to make the changes that the Holy Spirit will enable us to do to become more like Christ and give love 
unconditional love under any circumstances to one another. I pray for all the marriages that our church touches. I pray for the children. I pray for these young people that are coming to us through Willie's ministry that don't have parents, have never had parents. Father, there's, children, there's young people here that, that, that are connected with us that are downstairs with us right now who've never had a stable parent their whole life. They're 20 years old. They've never had a stable parent. People on drugs, people in jail, this has been their life. Give us, give us what we need to stand in that gap for these young people in this community. Give it to me, Father. Give me the the inner strength to stand and be a, just someone they can look to. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.